Good morning. It's good to be back with you here again at Community UCC Church. I, um, I was greeted so warmly this morning, and I don't know your name in the orange. No, in the orange, Jonathan. sorry. John? Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan greeted me so warmly, I wanted to transfer my membership here. <laughs> I, I absolutely see why you're growing in numbers, if that kind of love is uh, experienced when people come here. The other thing is, last time I was here, someone asked me, so will you um, invite or bring your partner with you next time you're here? Well, my partner is not a morning person. To get my partner, to get my partner up before noon is a miracle. And now my partner's away. Um, speaking at a philosophy conference in Hawaii while I'm left here in California. <laughs> so, but I will try and bring my partner one time. Will you pray with me? Um, God, we confess today that the chambers of our hearts, our homes, our houses of worship and homeland can be locked in doubt and fear. And yet you step through our fears and come to us in, as the children's minister said, in our points of anxiety. Breathe your spirit into us anew today, a spirit of peace. May our scars enable us to stand in love among those who have also been scarred. And please give us the courage to unlock our doors and invite you in. Give us faith to declare as Thomas that you are our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. I like to get personal when I preach, so I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever had a doubt? <laughs> Did I go to the right school? Did I take the right job? Did I buy the right car or home? Don't answer this next one if you're sitting next to your partner. <laughs> Did I marry the right person? Have you ever walked away from a situation wondering, what if I was wrong? What if what I think, what I believe, or what I am sure of is not true? I'm thankful for the Christian faith community I grew up in because it provided me a strong foundation in worship, in loving God, and it helped me develop the discipline of the study of scripture, praying, fasting, and even giving in the offering. However, they taught me that devout Christians should have no doubts. Maybe because uncertainty makes us anxious. We, we like having a solid plan with sure knowledge. It's, it's something of a human inclination to want to have complete loops or entire stories with no plot holes. So we in the Western world tend to think about doubts as negative things. Marvin Gaye in one of his songs says, believe half of what you see, some of none of what you hear. And there's truth to be told in the age of AI that I have a lot of doubts. I pray a lot, but I find myself doubting whether my prayers will ever be answered. And to be honest, there's sometimes that I'm God, glad God doesn't answer my prayers. <laughs> I have doubts about the things that people tell me. I have, I have learned that lots of what I have been told over the years, even in the church I grew up in, has not always been true. I have doubts about how many events in history were recorded or how the events in history were recorded. Was it history or his story? I have doubts about what I see on the news. I'm almost at the point that if I don't see anything for myself, then I don't truly believe it. I pray and I have faith, but I still have doubts. 
So I realized early on my spiritual journey that I was only kidding myself when I acted as if I had no doubts, no uncertainties regarding my faith. In one of his books, Philip Yancey asked the question, what if the church was a place that welcomes and wrestles with rather than punishes honesty and doubts? C.S. Lewis, who has who actually was an atheist before he was converted to Christianity, acknowledged that just as the Christian has moments of doubt, so does the atheist. You see, believing isn't always easy, especially when you wrestle with the complex issues of faith, especially when you wrestle with unanswered prayer, pain and suffering, injustice and hatred. Believing isn't always easy. When a loving, caring person dies and the evil, self-centered, narcissistic person lives. The Bible actually contains examples of heroes and sheroes who struggle with doubt. In Genesis, past their age of having children, Abraham and Sarah doubted whether or not the promise of God would come through. Mary and Martha in the gospel doubted Jesus' ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. You remember what they said, if you had been here. And in our gospel lesson for today, Thomas had doubts. He had doubts about Jesus' resurrection, but still in John, the 20th chapter and the 28th verse, something happened that transformed Thomas's doubts to a bold declaration of faith when Thomas declares, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God, or the Lord of me and the God of me. It's a significant statement from a surprising source. It's a declaration that captures our attention and demands our consideration. What does it mean to say that Jesus is our Lord and our God? Like chips and dips, ham and eggs, peanut butter and jelly? It's difficult for most of us to hear the name Thomas without attaching the prefix. Oh, y'all right on cue. I like that. <laughs> In fact, the 1999 Random House Webster's Dictionary defines doubting Thomas as a skeptic, a person who rarely trusts and who refuses to believe without proof or personal experience. Thomas, also known as Didymus, Didymus or the twin, I think Thomas was a Gemini, was one of the 12 apostles. He was one of the 12 apostles, and we don't know much about Thomas in the New Testament. We don't know anything about his parents. We don't know anything about his birth. We don't know anything about his rank in life, his previous occupation. Mark, Matthew, and Luke placed Thomas among the 12 disciples who later become apostles. And in the Gospel of John, we find that most of the information we have, we have in this Gospel about Thomas. Thomas is traditionally spoken of as a doubter, a disbeliever, but maybe Thomas was just curious. Maybe Thomas was just cautious. Maybe Thomas was a realist, a person who was driven to investigate, a person who was driven to inquire. Peter was always quick to jump into things. He opened his mouth and enter his feet. <laughs> he was usually the first to both speak up and act out often spoke before he thought that was Peter. But Thomas, Thomas wasn't impulsive. He wasn't prone to making blind judgments. Any confession of faith that Thomas made had to be true to his conviction. I love the part of the insert in your bulletin which says, if there are words that are used in this worship service that don't resonate with you, feel free to exchange your words. 
There might be someone here today who shares Thomas's characteristics. Unlike the confession in Matthew 16, where Peter declares Jesus to be the Christ, the son of the living God, the declaration of Thomas in our text today reminds us of language used by David in the 23rd Psalm. David and Thomas makes their confession personal by adding the word my. In Thomas's declaration, both nouns, Lord and God, are prefixed by the word my. At the first appearance of Jesus, Mary and the other disciples, after his resurrection, they were all gathered there in this room celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. But Thomas wasn't there. The cause of his absence is not recorded in scripture, nor does Jesus uh, criticize Thomas for not being in attendance. The first visit of Jesus to his disciples was to assure them that he had been resurrected from the dead and then to commission them with the Holy Spirit to continue spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus, their leader, had been crucified for disturbing the peace. And according to Matthew, Rumors were circulating that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus to make it seem that he had raised, been raised from the dead. So on this occasion of the first visit, the disciples were locked in a room. They were troubled and they were deathly afraid. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to do. And sensing their fear, Jesus entered into the dungeon of their fear. Jesus entered into the dungeon of their anxiety. See, I tied it into the children's talk. And he says to them, shalom, peace be with you. Jesus stepped into their terror, stepped into their dread, into their panic, into their anxiety, into their doubt, and he offers them peace. <laughs> I like to ask personal questions, so I'll say it again. Do you have a place in your life today where you need Jesus to bring some peace? Do you have a place in your life that you need Jesus to step into and say shalom? If so, the scripture declares that Jesus can step into our troubled situation and offer us peace. Jesus entered their prison of fear and said shalom. Now, the word that Jesus used in the text is a Hebrew word, and shalom is the opposite of disorder and confusion. Shalom means well-being, security, honest dealing, and true justice. Shalom or peace, as the Bible describes it, is not always the absence of conflict. You need to hear that one. But shalom means I can have peace in the middle of conflict. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. After stepping into their place of doubt and fear and offering them peace, the text reads that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that would empower them with the courage to witness to Jesus. And it is the same Holy Spirit that seals and, and baptizes us and claims us today. Even though Jesus' resurrection from the dead had been prophesied, in the Old Testament, this is spoken of by the prophet, Jesus himself in the Gospel of John makes it clear that it was only after the most forceful and compelling evidence, a physical appearance by the risen Christ, that the other disciples had believed that Jesus was actually alive. You see, the other disciples had felt the joy and the peace of seeing the resurrected Christ in the first visit. And Thomas's heart was still grieving, and he was awfully in doubt of the death of Jesus. He said, I, listen, I was there. I saw them kill him. I saw them put him in a tomb. I know he's dead. And so on the occasion of this second appearance of the resurrected Jesus, 
as the disciples had once again gathered into a room. And this time everybody was there, including Thomas. And once again, probably out of fear, the doors of the room were locked and, and Jesus entered and Jesus appearing to them a second time to convince them of his physical resurrection. He showed them the wounds incurred at his crucifixion. He showed them the scars in his hand and the scars in his feet and the scars in his side. He showed them his nail pierced hand. He showed them his scars. I read a very thought-provoking article some time ago about scars and how they relate to the grief and the pain of death of a loved one. The article stated that scars left behind after the death of a loved one are a testament of the life, of the love, and the relationship that was shared by two persons. And if a scar is deep, so is the love that was shared by these persons. Scars are a testament that I can love. Scars are a testament that I can be loved deeply. Scars can tough, can cut deep. And scars are a testament that I can heal and still live to love again. The article pointed out that scar tissues that form after a scar is often more potent than the original flesh itself. And finally, the article stated that those who cannot see the love behind the scar cannot appreciate the death of the loved one scars. John 20 and 19 pictures a situation that in many ways is too close for comfort for many of us because it describes a worried, even terrified bunch of Jesus' follows sheltered in place and fear. And Jesus entered into that place of fear, entered into that place of anxiety and doubt, and he showed them the scars. The other disciples had already been convinced of the resurrection of Jesus. So why did Jesus come and appear a second time? Could this appearance just be for Thomas? Remember, Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, unless I put my fingers in his side, I will not believe. Maybe Jesus appeared a second time because he wanted to help Thomas sort through his doubts. Maybe Jesus appeared a second time because he wanted to give Thomas the proof that he required. Maybe Jesus appeared a second time because he wanted to provide Thomas with the platform he declared he would be convinced and believed by. The truth is that Thomas didn't ask for anything that the other disciples didn't ask for. He's only seeking the proof that convinced the other disciples that Jesus was alive. Thomas knew that Jesus was dead. Some scholars suggest that he was either at the crucifixion or watched the crucifixion from a distance. Thomas doubted. And you know, I like Thomas <laughs> because he's not just going on what he heard someone else say. He's, he's not just going on someone else's experience, but he wanted to experience it for himself. Roberta Flack says it like this, Mama may have, <laughs> and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. Thomas wanted his first-hand experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The experience required to produce the faith in Thomas was for him to encounter the resurrected Jesus for himself. And so Thomas's questions and doubts didn't threaten Jesus. And I maintain today that our questions and our doubts don't threaten Jesus. 
Jesus didn't punish Thomas for his lack of faith. Instead, Jesus meets Thomas where he is, and Jesus invites him to do what he requested. Jesus told him, reach your hand out and touch my hand. The hands that healed the leper, touch my hands. The hands that restored blind people's eyes, touch my hands that unstopped deaf ears, touch my hands that caused the lame to walk, blessed the little children, were nailed to a cross, rolled back the gates of death and hell, touch my hands. Put your finger inside my scar. Love scars that I endured for all humanity. The place from which the blood shed for all of our sins. The place where salvation can be found. Can I put some money in the coin machine and just park here for just one second? Is there anybody in here who has ever been scarred? Uh, A loved one who died by suicide, scarred. Depression, scarred. Experiencing homophobia in America, scarred. Financial ruin, bankruptcy, scarred. Death of a partner, death of a parent, death of a child, scarred. Scarred by the church. Is there anybody in here who has ever been scarred? Scarred by racism and sexism. Somebody in here has been scarred. And somebody in here who has survived the scars. And I come to invite you to join me today. And when you've received professional help, when you have been healed, when it's appropriate, when it's safe to do so, don't be ashamed of your scar. D did you hear me? Don't be ashamed of your scar. Because our scars are a reminder of the pain. Our scars are a reminder of the abuse. Our scars are a reminder of the injustice we have endured, we have suffered, we have refused to allow, to rob us of our joy, to control our life, and to ruin us forever. Don't be ashamed of your scar. The interesting thing in the text is that we're not told whether or not Thomas actually did what he said he wanted to do. The text doesn't tell us whether or not Thomas actually touched Jesus' side. But we're told when he saw Jesus for himself, Thomas was once convinced, and once convinced, Thomas confessed, you are the Lord of me. Are you a God of me? Your scars, my scars, can help someone else who's doubting. Breathe on us, breath of God, until our hearts are pure. Breathe on us, breath of God, until we're entirely yours. Breathe on us, breath of God, until Thomas's confession become ours. <laughs>